countdown here. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> this is Jay Frost laughing, not at you, but with you as we encounter some technical difficulties in what otherwise is going to be an absolutely phenomenal presentation with Gatsby Brown today. And I'm going to give you a quick introduction to her as well as a big welcome to you here at the Donor Search Philanthropy Mastermind Series. Ignore all those images on your screen right now. Think of that as the Wizard of Oz. You know, ignore the man behind the curtain. You're going to see a full presentation properly, we hope, cross fingers, in just a moment. But before we go there, I do want to encourage you to have full uh, participation in this by utilizing the Q&A that we have right in the session. In fact, some of you are doing it already. You're saying, where are you? I'm still hearing the intro music. Hello. Yes, we did see all that. We couldn't respond to you because we were trying to make technology work. Uh, and fail as I did, I think we'll still have uh, some of these slides to show you. More importantly, we have smiling here and being the best sport about this in the world is the phenomenal Gatsby Brown. And I will try to give a proper introduction to her, although it's difficult because of all the work that she's done and all the impact that she's made. So I'm just going to give you a thimble full of uh, the biography of this exceptional leader in our field. Um, she has been uh, in this field for quite a long time, doing a number of things that are really important to us. Among those, of course, is to serve as um, uh, a CEO, of course, of the firm, the Gatsby Group, uh, which is a full service strategic planning, fundraising, consulting, and communications firm, which has guided nonprofits to hundreds of millions of dollars in support. So if you're not aware of her work in that sphere, I hope you'll take a look uh, at her website after the presentation today, and I'm sure we'll share that link with you. She's also in the faculty of the Fundraising School up at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, and I know you know what that is. She's the author of a number of books, including Seven Fatal Flaws in Nonprofit Boards, Another Magical Seven, The Seven Qualities of, of uh, um, uh, Campaign Success, and a book that's about to come out, uh, which is, of course, the same as the title of today's presentation, which is Think Like a Nonprofit, Act Like a Business. She'll tell you about that book that's coming out next year in a little bit. She's also on the Board of Trustees of Bethel University, an advisory board member at the Harvard University uh, Debate Council Diversity Project, and on an advisor to the Dorothy Johnson Center of Philanthropy at Grand Valley State University. So lots of different things. Plus, if you look just a little bit for a couple of minutes, you'll find that she's also a renowned artist, and her work is in collections everywhere. So rather than try and tell you more, I'm going to get out of the way and let her present to you. But I'm going to have to, of course, in order to do that, share my screen. So hopefully you'll be able to see all of the great slides she's presented, as well as doing what I try to do every time, which is to listen carefully, because she has a lot of wisdom to impart. So with that, thank you so much, Gasby, for being here today. Thank you, Jay, for having me here. It's, it's such a pleasure. And technology has its place. We have our challenges with it. And we're going to get over it. When you said it, I felt like it's the Wizard of Oz, yeah, take me to the wizard and we can uh, get started. I liked everything that you said in the introduction and appreciate it so much. I was motivated to write this book, Think Like a Nonprofit, Act Like a Business, because I love the nonprofit sector. It is so dear to me and I have uh, deep respect for all that the nonprofit sector has offered to this country and, and to the world. And uh, as a result, I thought it was time to begin to put into some kind of framework how the sector could do better because businesses have uh, been very, very successful in some of their operational principles. And then at the same time, of course, businesses have a lot to learn from us. So in writing, think like a nonprofit, act like a business, we really want to talk about the differences and the similarities of both sectors. Uh, one of the things that uh, I believe has been misrepresented and misunderstood about the nonprofit sector is the fact that there are three sectors that make this country and this economy move. And uh, you can go to the next slide, Jay, and that has to do with the government, business, and the nonprofit sector. So if we can move to the next slide, Jay, if that's possible, yes, just thinking right like now. a nonprofit, and then going to the next slide, acting like a business. So the next slide then shows that 
this, what we do as nonprofits, and we can go to that next slide, Jay. Mm -hmm. And it essentially talks about why do nonprofit organizations exist? We exist to change lives for the better. Peter Drucker, who is the guru of nonprofit thought, the late Peter Drucker, used to say, unless a nonprofit is in the business of changing lives, it needs to change its mission. So we can go to the next slide, because we exist to make lives and change lives and be transformational. So why do businesses exist? Businesses exist uh, to make a profit. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's part of the system that we live in, in a democracy. Next slide. There's just a little bit so of I lag after, uh, after each one, but go right ahead, Gatsby. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll wait. And if you hit that one more time, then you're going to bring up the sectors in this mm -hmm. particular slide. And that's what I spoke about with regard to business, government, and nonprofit. Uh, these are the sectors that drive the U.S. economy. And you can see that 11.4% uh, 11.4 million, I'm sorry, jobs exist because of the nonprofit sector. And when we talk about the gross uh, domestic product, it's estimated to be $23 trillion, and it was in uh, the third quarter of 2021, that says 2020, but 2020 and uh, in 2020. And so as a result, uh, we know that there are trillions of dollars that the nonprofit sector contributes to the U.S. economy. Next slide. And so, and hit this twice, Jay. Uh, I will. Business versus nonprofit operational principles, you can see. For businesses, and when you begin to look at the differences between the two, both have a mission, but the mission of a business is corporate profits. The mission of a nonprofit is to change lives. The source of money would be capitalization and sales. The source of money is fundraising and earned income for nonprofits. It is customer centered on the business side. On our side, it's, we're donor centered. We both have a vision. We both have core values. We both en have engaged boards. Nonprofits have to have engaged boards, and so do businesses. Strong leadership is very important for both. Knowing customers, very important for businesses, and for us, knowing our donors. And then marketing and branding. That is ubiquitous across the board. Nonprofits need marketing and branding just like businesses. Strategic planning, the same, although it's called most in, in most cases for businesses, a business plan. Uh, with businesses, it's products, goods, and services. And with nonprofits, it's programs, services, and then some products, depending on the nonprofit. And then talented employees are very important for businesses and talented staff, very important for nonprofits. And that means that there has to be a passion for the mission. On the business side, it really has to be uh, some bonus incentives and some other financial incentives and some belief in the product as well. And then sound financial for both uh, sectors. And then in the business sector, it's usually called KPIs or key performance indicators. And sometimes nonprofits use that term too, but we mainly call it evaluation. Next slide. So you see the operational principles there. And then what I have found in my years of experience is that while there are real similarities here, I have found some red flags for nonprofits because believe me, I have seen the great, the good, the bad, the ugliest and the ugly. And from that, I have seen uh, sometimes across the board a need to be more donor centered. Uh, in the nonprofit world, we tend to think about what we need in order to operate rather than the needs of the donor, and that has to change. Uh, the vision. Uh, sometimes I don't see a lot of vision. I see missional uh, work, but I'm not seeing a lot of vision in uh, some cases with some nonprofits. An engaged board, uh, I, could, uh, I wish I had a dollar for each time I mentioned 
do you have the board that you need? And that doesn't come up. And so then we need uh, to know our donors. We need strong, strong leaders. And we do have many, many strong leaders in the nonprofit sector. But then there is this notion that people fall into the nonprofit sector because they couldn't make it in, in corporate America or in business. And uh, we want to dispel that myth. Um, then talented staff want to make sure that the people that are working for the organization are all on the same page, pulling on the same oars with passion for the mission. Sometimes because of uh, various economic uh, downfalls, people fall into the nonprofit space, not really believing in it, but it's a job. So we want to make sure that that is uh, overcome. And then evaluation. I'd find that there's not enough evaluation and metrics being applied to the work that we do in the nonprofit world. And what gets measured gets done. So we want to uh, make sure we're addressing that. Let's go to the next slide. Success is intentional. And you can see that there is an, an exit ramp for success. Next slide, Jay. It is so, coming. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and I'm learning to be patient. That the A uh, A type in me is is going like, Grr! but uh, <laughs> the other part of me is saying, we're going to get this done. So nonprofit organizations must do everything through the lens of your mission. Everything. That's why we call, we want to uh, avoid mission creep and uh, making sure that the the mission is solid so that we are staying within the mission parameters. Next. So we'll start with the mission. And this is where you'll come in as an audience, because I want to talk about how we craft a mission statement. Next. Now you can see that businesses are clear about their mission. You're not going to find in, in many instances, or probably at all, a tractor company that is dealing with farming equipment saying that they want, want to deal with hair care products as well. They're sticking to the mission of the product and what they're there to do. And this is what we need to do more of because too often nonprofit mission statements are too long and unclear. Let's talk about clear mission statements. Next. So what I'd like you to do is to ponder and decide why you do what you do and what do you believe, just as a starting point here. And we'll go to the next slide. What do you believe? And I know many of you have probably watched Simon Sinek on, uh, on TED Talks where he talks about what do you believe. But that is a great starting point to get to the essential mission statement elements, who you are, what you do, who you do it for, and what's the impact. Next slide. Because what I found in many instances too, that the impact is missing from many mission statements. Here's Google's mission, uh, mission statement. Uh, no matter how you feel about Google, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it a universally ac accessible and useful. Very, very clear. Let's go to the next slide that's going to talk about a nonprofit statement that I think is a leading practice. I used to say best practices, but after reading Adam Grant's book about Think Again, I say leading practices because best practices means that you're at the, the end of that, that, there's nothing else that can be done. So this leading practice from a nonprofit mission statement is from Charity Water, their mission. Charity Water is a nonprofit organization bringing clean, and safe drinking water to people in developing countries and nations, rather. So here's the litmus test. Who are they? What do they do? And who they do it for? And what's the impact? That was clear in that. So this is your turn. And put it in the chat. I hope you brought your mission statement or know it by heart. Does your organization's mission statement pass the litmus test? Does it say who you are, what you do, who you do it for, and what's the impact? But we'll go to the chat for this, Jay. Sure. Um, and in fact, uh, Gatsby, as as we're waiting for people to respond to those 
really important questions. There were a number of uh, questions and comments which had come in earlier. So I don't know if you'd like to take those on now or while we're waiting or not. Sure. Um, and while we're waiting uh, on chat, sure. Sure. Um, there were a number of comments here. I want to start right uh, kind of in reverse chronolo chronological order. Um, uh, Amy had mentioned, for what it's worth, I've often differentiated between for-profit and non-profit by reflecting that one entity asks us to purchase a product and the other asks us to invest in the promise of a better future. Oh, I like that, Amy. That's excellent. And, and so very, very true. And I think we must give credit too to in the for-profit sector, uh, the products that some of them are offering are making for better futures as well. So there can be some interrelationship there. I do want to point out that many people believe that nonprofit doesn't mean any profit. It doesn't, nonprofit mm -hmm. does not mean no profit. Because as we have been able to enforce, to reflect and reimagine and recalibrate because of COVID-19, it is obvious that we have to have reserves. Those nonprofit organizations that had reserves because there was some profit, if you, in quotes, that were able to survive and thrive through the COVID period and this one too. So reserves fall into that, uh, uh, that category. And I wanna make sure that we understand that nonprofit does not mean no profit. That's such an important observation, even though it seems like a, a semantic one. It's so critical. We also had a note from Alex earlier who just said, and I can't remember what he's disagreeing with, but it's one of the slides he said earlier. He says, I disagree. Businesses need uh, businesses exist to solve problems, Alex says, and make a profit doing so. So I don't know if you have additional thoughts on that. Well, it, it goes back to the marketing principle. Some businesses uh it espouse the, the marketing principle, build it and they will come. Others mm -hmm. find a need and fill it. So those who build it and believe that they would come, they would not fall into the category of solving problems. They wanted, they had vision and wanted to see something uh, take place. And uh, whatever their belief in it was, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was uh, built to solve a problem, but some uh, some businesses do start from that marketing principle, find the need and fill it. But there are two roads that they go down in that regard. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we do have a number of comments now and comments on, of course, uh, mission statements. Uh, Tara Good. had said, to ensure sustainable access to safe water, sanitation and hygiene for the most vulnerable communities through innovative partnerships, creativity and the power of art. It sounds like she's got that one committed to memory. So that's, that's wonderful. Yes. So uh, let's see if that passes the litmus test. Does it say who hmm. you are? Hmm. Does it say what you do? And I heard a lot about what you do. Who do hmm. you do it for? I didn't hear a lot about that. And what's the hmm. impact? That was what I thought was missing a little bit on that one. Right. Um, well, they do mention vulnerable communities, but I, I see your point. It's uh, that that defines, of course, many many vulnerable communities. Yes. Uh, we have a comment from Sandra who said, "Yes, we spend a lot of time formulating our mission statement," and I, I know that uh, Sandra's not alone in that. Um, yes, we have Sandra. Katie, <laughs> who says, "Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota, we lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures." and save lives. That's an excellent, excellent mission statement. It passed the litmus test on everything, who you are. And by the way, I was just in Minneapolis the other day uh, and it was 27 below. Thank you very much. Uh, what wow. you do, and uh, it, it says that very clearly, who you do it for, it was just very, very clear and the impact to make sure that seizures are no longer in doing the research for uh, seizure prevention and, and and eliminating it. So that was excellent, very, very good. I would say you, you're doing great work there on your mission Would you like statement. to hear a few more? Yeah, would you like to we hear can do more? one. Yeah, one more one we more? can take and then we need to move on for just a moment. Sure, sure. Um, Nancy had said, our mission is to impact the life-saving capabilities and the lives of local heroes and their communities. Okay, so who are you? 
Nancy, who are you? I, I need to hear who you are as an organization. Mm. What And then you talked about what you do, which was excellent, who you do it for. And I would like a little bit more clarity about the impact. Right. And who those yeah. heroes are. And it's possible, Gatsby, that uh, sometimes when people are answering uh, here, either in chat or in the Q&A box, um, that they, they either don't have the space or the time, uh, or maybe are, are uh, aware that uh, what they post here is something they're not prepared to share. So that may account for part of the- uh, Okay, uh, some kind I get of it. Um, but others have been very, uh, very clear in some of these comments talking about the names of the organizations and who they serve. But this is such a great list, what you're talking about, um, about the litmus test. Uh, would you like me to move on to the next slide? Yes, please. And Nancy, thank you. It, it, just add the name of your organization anonymously or whatever. And I think your, your mission statement is on the right track. I need a little bit more clarity about who you're doing it for and the impact. So the vision statement, businesses uh, with a vision are forward thinking. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, to talk about this some more. Okay. And I've been using this for years. This was so long ago that the vision for Amazon from Jeff Bezos was, mm -hmm. our vision is to be the earth's most customer centric company to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. This vision statement was crafted when Amazon was a book company. Some of you may not remember how Amazon started, but it started out selling books. But look at what it is today. And that's why on the next slide, I encourage all nonprofits to be aspirational about your vision. Don't mm -hmm. repurpose your mission statement, but really what is it that you want to change uh, and what will take place as a result of the work that you do? And so anybody want to offer up a vision statement, a couple of people that uh, they would be able to share with the group? Okay, let me go back to the chat and take a look as people, right? Okay. Um, and we're starting to get them. So uh, Sandra had written to inspire unprecedented levels of philanthropy in support of SUMA Health to enhance the patient experience, empower clinical excellence and improve the health of our community. Um, and let me see, Jenny like the, writes, uh, oh, well, well, let me just answer her, the first one. I like the first part of what you said as a vision. The other sounds like you are repurposing your mission because that's what you're doing in the health. You are improving people's health. So I would uh, really encourage you to concentrate on the aspirational 50 years from now. What do you want to accomplish? Think in terms of aspiration, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, Jay, you said someone else had something? Yes, we have something from Jenny, and who writes, to positively impact the health of everyone in our community by providing the financial resources necessary to fulfill Barton Health's mission. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would uh, say, and, and maybe recommend to you that uh, your vision would be that everyone would have the finances to take care of their health, something along those lines, that everyone would have the ability to, uh, through their finances, to take care of their health. You, you, you're with me on the track that I'm going there, because otherwise then you are repurposing the, um, the mission statement a little bit too much. We have one from one Ashley. Sure. Uh, this one from Ashley is Dance USA's vision, propelled by our belief that dance can inspire a more just and humane world. Dance USA will amplify the power of dance to inform and inspire a nation where creativity and the field thrive. Okay, that sounds like mission all over again, once again. Uh, that vision is that uh, could, could possibly be that dance be elevated and amplified so that it is appreciated by everyone. Something like that, appreciated and valued by everyone. That's the aspirational mission. I mean, vision, I'm sorry, uh, because you don't want to get that muddled up with your mission. Remember, your mission is what you do. 
what you and who you're doing it for. So if you go to what you're doing now as your your vision, that's not vision. That's your mission. Mm. Okay, we could talk about this a long time, but uh, we need to go <laughs> to the next slide in order to get through okay. the entire presentation. So we want to talk up. about yep, strategic planning. Businesses have a business plan. Uh, if we're going to think like a nonprofit, act like a business, we need to have strategic planning. Next slide. That's This is your organization's roadmap, and you can just change to the next one on, on this. Just to look at the winding road, we're on a journey here. And I love this quote, strategic planning. Planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it now. Oh, I just think that's so great. Next slide. So here are the planning essentials. Strategic priorities must be identified. Doing a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. Compare yourselves with other organizations that are doing like work. What uh, does their board look like? Uh, what staffing needs have they been able to um, accomplish? What achievements have they been able to accomplish compared to where you want to be? And it's uh, the Rick Warren from A Purpose Driven Life has often, well, he says in his book, you shouldn't compare yourselves to others because either you'll come out looking superior or inferior and neither one of those are good. However, we're just talking about organizational comparisons so that you can have some sort of yardstick to measure where you are as an organization. Timelines are important, benchmarks, what are we going to accomplish and when, milestones so we can know what we're accomplishing, accountability, which is so very important. I've seen so many strategic plans that are merely a to-do list and you don't want just a to-do list. You want to be able to uh, speak to who is responsible for doing each of the pieces of work that needs to be done. So we know that a uh, strategic plan should be smart, strategic, measurable, achievable, realistic, and tangible so that uh, it can be measured and it can be achieved. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So when you have the CEO or executive director or president, whatever it's called, and the board of directors understand the strategic plan, they commit to executing the plan then this formula means that they will accomplish and you as an organization will accomplish both your mission and your vision. Next. So in thinking like a nonprofit, acting like a business, businesses carefully select board members. And I know your ears are perking up on this one because I hear a lot about uh, disappointment with boards, but then I also hear about great successes. So. Nonprofits must be intentional and strategic in selecting board members. Let's go to the next slide and that's going to speak to, how would you rate your board? And we can go in the chat for this. Would you give them an A in fundraising, an A in uh, accountability? Would you give them an A plus in being clear about their roles and evaluating the CEO? Do they get an A there? And uh, a board that does not micromanage should definitely get an A. How's your board looking? We'll take a, a pause here for a few, and you can remain anonymous on, in this part, but just let us know how <laughs> your board is doing. <laughs> I will not share names of people <laughs> responding or their organizations. <laughs> and uh, it still might remain quiet, we'll, we'll see. Oh, yes. so All right. Let's let go to the next slide. Well, well, no, we, do, we do have a comment, though, Gatsby. I want to make sure. <laughs> so one person did comment that uh, too many po pre, uh, people on their board were appointed because they were friends of the founder. And, I, and I, that's something I've heard before. I'm sure you have as well. Yes, that's a very common thing to take place. And uh, one of my mentors say, says that, uh, used to say he is, uh, is deceased now. He said that... Um, Many nonprofits don't get the board they need, they get the board they deserve. So I had to mm. fasten my seatbelt for that one because it's pretty harsh, but it is true. So when uh, friends of the founder are uh, appointed to the board and it's uh, like a club, 
and it's not mm -hmm. made up of uh, uh, someone that I know says that the board should be made up of four W's, wisdom, wealth, wow, and work. And so uh, if it's, it's not going to do that and propel the mission of the organization forward, then it is not a good board. So someone says that their board is excellent. Did I, do I see that? Okay. Yeah, well, I, I think so. We're, we're getting, yes, uh, excellent. And, and again, I'm not going to give names too bad in this case, um, that they have an incredibly involved, supportive, and non-micromanaging board. And several other people have talked about micromanagement. So that's a theme. Um, but yes. uh, several people have said that they have a board that that they might rate as a B, but that they mm -hmm. a, but they don't micromanage. So that's something that's clearly in everyone's minds. Yes, that's that's so important because... I have seen boards who believe that they should be directly in touch with staff and, and telling them and directing them what to do when that is the executive director, president, or CEO's job to, to run the organization and not get that in the weeds of uh, mm -hmm. being in touch with staff members and confusing them about who's in charge. So micromanaging is a no-no. I feel like there can be no, no, no. <laughs> Something else that came up in a number of responses who, where people were very specific in their grading um, was it grades from a C to an F on fundraising. So you may be mm. talking about that in a moment, but I wanted to make sure you heard that that was a common complaint as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that feedback. And it's um, all too common, unfortunately, but we're going to fix that as we evolve as a sector. All right, let's go to the next slide. Sure, coming right up. So I don't know if you can see this well, and this comes from the wonderful the fundraising school at the Indiana University's Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And this is the fairy tale uh, from Planet uh, uh, Fairy Tale for board members, where the board member is saying, so tell me about how the uh, philanthropist comes and saves Cinderella's organization Tell me again and again and again. And that is just what it is, a fairy tale. Uh, board members must be involved in fundraising. And right. members of the board of an organization, and particularly the board chair, are key members of your organization's team. They must give an annual personal gift to the organization. Uh, board members must be active participants in fundraising on behalf of the organization. They must be in ambassadors. And some board members may feel that they are not ready or equipped to make a solicitation or ask. But there are other ways that they can be involved. How about the thank you notes to the donors that uh, have given? And how about uh, hosting something that uh, donors can come together to be thanked? And those sorts of things that really still contribute to successful fundraising but are not necessarily direct ask. You want the most talented people uh, on your board to be involved in that. And you, of course, must have 100% board giving. That's a given. Uh, every foundation these days is asking for that. And uh, in order to get grants, that is very, very important. Moving right along here in terms of the board, here is the process, once again, from the fundraising school, the, the fundraising approach the team the mission the board and the staff that's the team and it breaks at its weakest point and the process is cultivation solicitation and then stewardship many people get cultivation and stewardship confused but you must cultivate those potential donors before you make an ask and then knowing the right time to make the solicitation and then stewarding the gift by letting them know the impact of the gift letting them know about the organization's overall impact and the difference that you're making. So that's the stewardship part of it. And stewardship, of course, is giving the receipt and making sure that the thank yous are, are given uh, within 48 hours of their gift. So that process fails unless it's understood because too many people want to jump right into solicitation before going into cultivation. And then donors must have linkage, ability, and interest. And if you fail to qualify each one before moving forward, you may be moving too fast and making your move too soon for the ask. So here's what the board depends on staff for, the knowledge of the volunteer fundraising expertise, 
um, for the knowledge of the community, your professionalism, and also sensitivity, ethical behavior, of course, and then your sensitivity to board members' needs. So if you click that again, Jay, you'll see what the staff expects of board members, which is very reasonable, to believe in the mission, to give, to influence, to have some knowledge of prospective donors, time, energy to do the work, asking for gifts, and then pride in the accomplishment. There, for those of you who have gone through this, you know about the great sense of uh, deep appreciation and um, a sense of fulfillment once you have a gift and the donor is happy, you're happy, and uh, your mission is being fulfilled. So Peter Drucker, once again, uh, with so many pearls of wisdom, he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you can have the best strategic plan in the world, but unless the culture is ready to embrace it, there's going to be some problems. So we'll go to the next slide that will elaborate on that some more. Creating the organizational culture where people want to work. And this has been, uh, you know, corporations uh, have tried to make their cultures even better, and they, I think they could learn from nonprofits, quite frankly, on how to create a better culture of camaraderie. But when we look at Glassdoor and it talks about the best places to work, and there's a list of them, and we'll go to that on the next slide, and you can just slide to that, uh, Jay, mm -hmm. where some of the best places to work through Glassdoors and Glassdoor and how it's been um, rated, but also there have been incentives that uh, that businesses have now provided to get people to work. Look at like Amazon and McDonald's, and they're paying people, giving them signing bonuses and, and the like. Go to the next slide, Jay, and this is a, a list here, and then there's another list of those who Bartlett Plumbing and um, Expanding Horizons and Hilton Hotels, they're giving all kinds of incentives to make sure that they're getting good employees. Uh, that there's a lesson there that maybe we could learn from and see these are some of the the corporate cultures that lead to powerful production from uh, Glassdoor's point of view and people had a great deal of satisfaction in working there in some cases. Let's go to the next slide and talk about what this means for nonprofits because hiring and retention uh, can be a challenge for nonprofits and you'll see that uh, on the next slide that the Chronicle of Philanthropy uh, did a, a, a uh, an issue where it says why fundraisers are fed up. And it breaks down some of the reasons. And one of the key reasons that fundraisers in particular that work for nonprofits are getting fed up and have left is because the expectations have been too high too soon and uh, they've been unrealistic and there has not been enough support from both the board and other factors in the organization to make the fundraising successful. So there is a real need to make sure that expectations are realistic. Certainly they should be stretch expectations, but not so unrealistic until they cannot be achieved. Let's go to the next slide and uh, I'll give you time to ruminate on that. So Nonprofit Times has its best nonprofits to work for. And uh, let's go and see what that's all about, Jay. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is the, well, a, a, a bar chart that talks about leadership and planning and the various areas that are so important to um, the uh, satisfaction of employees. Let's go to the next one because that one's a little hard to read for right now, but in the, in the YouTube, it will be uh, much easier. So, Mm -hmm. Do something. Uh, wounded warrior, warrior, musicians on call, trauma and resilience, the Lord's place. Uh, and various organizations have been called out as really being great places to work because of the climate that has been created for uh, staff and nonprofits. Let's go to the next one. So here were the top key drivers. You can see this better. I feel I am valued in this organization. Doesn't that mean a lot? To feel that we're valued in the organizations that we're working with? Most days I feel I've made progress at work. There's nothing like feeling we're grinding and grinding and nothing is taking place and the needle is not moving. 
uh, the mission towards its goal. I have confidence in the leadership of this organization, so important, trusted leadership. I like the type of work that I do, and on and on. Any comments on these key drivers and how you may feel, audience, about some of these key drivers and will any of this apply to you? Let me take a look in the chat and see if we okay. have any comments on these. And, and while we're waiting for those, there were great comments being made along the path talking about how organizations are trying to adjust and make sure that their fundraisers aren't fed up. And one of them was about how, uh, once again, up there in very cold but wonderful Minnesota, uh, the Epilogue Foundation moved to a 36-hour work week, the work week ending at two on Fridays year-round. And um, mm -hmm. so it's... Uh, uh, different measures that organizations are taking in order to attract and retain uh, this vital force for the successful organization. And Jay, isn't it so important? And thank you once again for, sh for sharing uh, that uh, story about the Epilepsy Foundation there. Uh, we in this time have to reflect and reimagine and recalibrate where necessary. If there was any time for innovation, and thinking about what has been done in the past and what needs to be done now, now is the time. Uh, it used to be referred to as the new normal. I refer to it as the now normal. So let's move to the next slide. Did we get any uh, other comments about uh, none, this particular None yet, just that, okay. no, although Britt did mention this is all very relevant. So perhaps people are thinking about what they can do to ensure that their fundraisers are really feeling uh, uh, successful in their environments. The key drivers are in place. Terrific. While businesses must build a culture of productivity, and productivity is important for nonprofits, but there's another culture that we need to focus on as well, and that's on the next slide. Uh, well, this is about team building, and uh, this really comes from uh, Patrick uh, Leonsi, who really talks about trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and results, and how that is all reconciled. And he gives great, um, great tips on how to make sure that trust is built and how conflict should be handled, commitment, accountability, and results. Let's go to the next slide. Nonprofits must build a culture of philanthropy. And what do we mean by that in this next slide? The next several slides will speak to why nonprofits must build that, con that kind of culture. Uh, remembering again that Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So a culture of philanthropy is led by the board and senior staff. It's donor-centered. It's focused on relationships driven by your case for support aligning your values with the needs of the community and the larger community, depending on whether you are a national or international organization. And the development office is adequately resourced, but everyone plays a role in philanthropy. So the other thing that I want to point out is that businesses have a margin matrix that tells them what products are yielding the highest ROI, return on investment. So this next slide is in terms of our fundraising and how boards look at what we do. Nonprofits, you need to review your margin matrix and know to what degree each program contributes to your mission and your financial margin. Every employee, every staff member should know that. To what degree each program contributes to your mission. So. The fundraising decisions should be also based on return on investment. And Jim Greenfield, uh, one of our colleagues, did a wonderful job, and we can go to the next slide, where he lays out the ROI and the cost to raise a, a dollar. Take a look at this. Return on investment for fundraising vehicle. And many of you have seen this before. That CRD there is cost to raise a dollar. ROI, return on investment. Without uh, having a donor base and data, a solid database, when you start out, you have to rent or buy a list, knowing that the cost to raise the dollar is going to be $1.15, and you're going to lose money 
in the in the first part of it. But we'll we're going to go down to uh, when you have this in place. It's so it's worth the investment. Special events, which I have a bias against, uh, just to let you know, uh, there is a 50-50 return on special events. Plan giving, the cost to raise a dollar, 25 cents on a dollar, but you get 75 cents in return. For direct mail, when it is a more mature direct mail uh, list with previous donors that you're tracking, 20 cents on the dollar to raise, but you're getting an 80 cent return. Foundations and corporations putting 20% of uh, your cost to raise the dollar there and then 80 cents in on the ROI. Major gifts, which is the, the most wonderful return here, five to 10 cents on the dollar and 90 to 95 cents return. So the average of all of this is, is uh, 20 cents and then 80 cents on the, on the dollar that you are able to, to raise with this return. So getting, when you look at uh, something like that, you've got to ask yourself, and why are we continuing doing the golf tournament that's not making any money when we should be focusing more on major gifts where we're getting a, a larger return? Um, so, or that, uh, that dinner or lunch, that is a cultivation mechanism but it is not uh, raising any money. So there we get to the point of also being able to discern whether it is a fun FUN raiser, a friend raiser, or an FUND fund raiser. And if it is a fund raiser, it should be meeting its financial goals. Okay, businesses know about the business climate and nonprofits must know the philanthropic landscape. So let's look at the philanthropic landscape. And here you can see that $471 billion were contributed to uh, nonprofits and charities in uh, 2020. You know, we all wait for bated breath for the Giving USA report to come out that will give us this year in June what last year looked like. So in 2020, we can see that uh, that was a great deal of money given to charities. 69% coming from individuals, 4% from corporations, 9% um, from bequest, and 19% from foundations. Since at least half of the foundations are family foundations and bequests are all um, individuals, you add that along with the 69% and you're really in the 96 or 92% percentile on individual giving. So, why are we just comp uh, concentrating on corporations? That's a question to be asked. Next slide. Which really does, uh, it breaks down the sectors. And uh, I know many of you have received the Giving USA report. If you haven't, uh, please go to the um, Lilly Family School of Philanthropy's website and uh, get the report, or you can Google it, and it will be there uh, to, for you to be able to see how your sector fared in, in the giving. Uh, religious organizations first, and then um, education and human services were, were following all of that. Let's move to the next slide. I just encourage you, for those of you who don't know about the Giving USA report, uh, we move through that. I think I want to move uh, past all of these slides with the bar graphs, Jay, and uh, get right to the business of this. Businesses know their customers. They know them through studying the demographics, psychographics, the clicks, the views, the followers. And the next slide says we must do the same thing in the nonprofit sector. And there mm -hmm. are uh, so many ways that we can do this. We need to know our donors and, and the potential ones. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about psychographics. What are donors thinking? And there are ways to know that. Uh, just as businesses look at uh, metrics and marketing and they do research, uh, the next slide is going to go further into what the psychographics are. The nonprofit marketing principle exchange of values is values. That's the marketing principle. It's about exchange of values. What do donors get by giving to your organization? And what do you get in return? Of course, you get gifts 
and the resources to do the work. So here's some, and, and the reason why that value is so important to talk about, because we don't want to use these inappropriate terms. We can go back to the inappropriate terms, um, Jay, because uh, I, I cringe when people say we're going to hit people up or put the arm on or do, oh, I'm going out to do some arm twisting today. These are people who don't really know fundraising. Uh, I'm, we've got to put the squeeze on people or shake them down. We have some suspects. We give to organizations. We don't want to be referred to as suspects. I'm going out, I heard someone say once, and I thought I was going to have a hissy fit. Uh, they said, I'm going out and do some begging today. And pitching is, is something that is commonly used, but we really don't pitch. That's in sales. We're in philanthropy, and the nuances are given. That's why we don't say you should give, you ought to give, you owe us. Corporations don't say you owe us. Corporations say we're going to provide a, pro, a product to you that is so good you'll want to buy it. Okay, and what we want to do with uh, donors is to meet them where they are with and, and give them great satisfaction in making a difference. So uh, Dr. Sarah Conrath at uh, the Lilly Family School, and she's on uh, a hiatus and sabbatical right now, but she talks about the psychological motives for giving and volunteering, and we can go to the next slide and move quickly th through this because uh, this will be available, and you need to click several times to get the age differences in giving uh, in young adulthood. There's the ego, but broke, middle age, the ego and all of that is taking place and there is trust. Click it one more time because the trust oh. factor is, <laughs> yes. is, yeah, that's important for all age groups. The trust factor in your organization. In middle age, people are starting to have children or have children and moving along with their lives, trust is the most important thing because they are already dealing with the ego and uh, feeling a sense of altruism. And then older adults, they want to have the sense of social gathering and belonging and being a part of something, tax write-offs, and of course, trust. And the U.S. Uh, Trust, Bank of America, and the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy have done studies that speak to uh, very, very, for high net worth individuals who say that they trust the organization, the nonprofit, to do the work where they cannot do, uh, do it alone. So that trust factor is very important. Let's go to the next one. So here are, and just keep clicking, some ideas about some appeals when you are appealing to your donors. Uh, to those who are altruistic, want to help most? Click here to make an unrestricted gift appeal to the social motives, those people who really are very social and want to be with other people uh, in this uh, giving area. Check this box to care pool with a friend. We'll send them an invitation to give. Direct appeal to trust motives. We have the highest rating for financial accountability and transparency with Charity Navigator and independent other independent watchdog agencies. Um, direct appeal to the ego. Donations of $25 or more are published in our monthly newsletter because they want to have recognition. Uh, direct appeal to tax motives, 100% of your donation is tax deductible. And uh, if we click one more time, we ah, yes. will definitely go to direct appeal to anybody who says they have restraints. I'm broke. So you can say every single dollar counts Donate as little as a dollar at a time because you want to get people in the habit of giving. So you, you, you can start with that group. So businesses are making their board staff and marketing approaches more equitable. Next slide speaks to how we as nonprofits have to change how we achieve equity on board staff donors, the donors and marketing approaches. Let's move ahead here quickly. Mm -hmm. um, women, women giving. And we'll go to the next slide. A lot of studies have been done with regard to how women give. Single women are more likely than single men to give to charity. How about that? Women give higher amounts, controlling for income and wealth, of course, but they tend to be more generous. Women tend to spread their giving across more organizations, and men concentrate their giving mainly on one thing. And uh, women are more likely to give almost every year as opposed to men sometimes skipping. So let's go to the next one. We can see that uh, there are some shared 
decisions that be, are being made by households about giving to your organizations, but 77, not 75%, it is more likely to be a woman to make the, the ultimate decision on how they're going to, a couple will give, a household will give, and how much. Do you find that interesting? Women. All right. Then we look at the African-American uh, philanthropic landscape, and we'll go to the next slide for that. Because there is gold in Dimdar Hills, and it's being uh, ignored in many cases. So the next slide will go into some more detail. Um, they give more as a percentage. Next slide to income. According to the Coalition of New Philanthropy, African Americans in the New York region gave more annually than either Latinos or Asian Americans. Next slide. We're talking about equity and diversity. Let's see, you can talk about diversity, but in my mind, that's checking off boxes and it's a where, where to start. But when you talk about equity, you're talking about something a lot more serious. Uh, African American high net worth philanthropists are significantly more likely to monitor or evaluate the impact of their giving. Well, it tells you that a lot of communication uh, needs to take place. And once again, this is knowing your donors, diversifying your fundraising base. Uh, high, high net worth African-American individuals are significantly more likely to plan to increase their contribution in the next three years. Cultivation is key there. And then the implication that uh, religious giving is uh, very high is a correct one. Let's go to the next slide and delve a little bit more deeply into this. Uh, the three C's of black philanthropy, cornerstone, giving to higher education and the arts, really, really high. Community, donating to organizations that serve the black community and consecrated. There is a lot of giving to churches, but the misnomer is that Black philanthropy is giving all to churches, and that's not true because education, higher education, and the arts are playing a big role. So you can see some of the people, they're not all famous, that are actually giving at high levels. Uh, usually I'll I begin to ask, can you point out anyone in, in these photographs? But in the interest of time, I won't. Maybe when if you're able to go back and watch this on YouTube, you'll scrutinize this and see if you know of anyone that's in, uh, any pictures here. And on the next slide, there are more photos of people. But for example, the woman, the third one uh, uh, on that previous one, you don't have to go back there. Um, her name is Eileen Norton. And if you have Norton an antivirus on your computer, uh, she and her husband founded that company. They're now divorced, but she is a philanthropist and has uh, incredible capacity. So this is just another visual. Um, and the other person that's in that visual, the second to the bottom to my left is Osceola McCarty, who was a laundress who gave $250,000 to the University of uh, Southern Mississippi. So don't count anyone out. Let's go to the next one. Because the African American, uh, the National Museum of African American Culture and History um, it was a game changer. We can go to the next slide. So much money was raised from the African American community for um, the African American Museum that it was a game changer in understanding the wealth that exists within the, that community. I and I said before, don't count anyone out. Uh, she gave her gift was actually one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The, the uh, University of Southern Mississippi. And it was the largest gift at that time from an individual that they had ever received. And she didn't even know how to, uh, because she had a third grade education, lived frugally and a wonderful person that I had an opportunity to spend time with. And the, the dollars that she had accrued because she would take in laundry was so big, the banker had to take 10 dimes and have her push those towards where she wanted her money to go. So it's a that's a precious story. We'll move on. So engaging in fundraising forecasting is so important because businesses engage in sales forecasting. How are we to know whether or not we will be successful? This is another learning that we can uh, get from acting like a business. 
let's move to the next slide and I'll elaborate on that as we are beginning to wind up. So how to measure success and forecast future annual giving. The annual giving program of your organization is the linchpin of all giving. Your major gifts come from there. You can uh, glean how capital campaigns will be, uh, could be successful out of your annual giving program. So it is important, and we'll go to the next slide, to really uh, understand the value of looking at the predictors of charitable giving, the S&P 500, personal income, charitable giving, and previous giving. So the next slide is really going to speak to how we the metrics are determined. Repeat donor renewal rates across the country. Uh, the average rates across the country is 70% for renewal. Upgrade and downgrade rates you want to look at. New and recaptured donors, looking at that metrics by appeal strategies, whether it's direct mail, phone, social media, email, and events. Go with those things that are giving you the best return. So we go with RFM with data, data mining, RFM, recency, frequency, and monetary value. How recent was your donor's last gift? How frequently have they given? And how much has the donor given you? So yeah, that was great, Jay. You can move to the next one now. <laughs> because what is measured gets done. And we know that uh, for a fact. The more you measure, the more you'll get the work done. So the next slide, as we wind up here. So as you think like a nonprofit, which is a wonderful way to think, how can we make a difference in the world? What problem can we solve? And the fact that we are uniquely positioned to solve it is so important. But then again, taking lessons from the next slide, which is act like a business in the process of this wonderful work that we're doing. So we'll go to the next slide and uh, we will begin to, um, to wind up here. Uh, this is uh, just for your benefit. This is an example of innovative thinking collaborations with businesses and nonprofits. And I just want to let you know that uh, Comcast, NBC Universal Foundation, and the NBC Universal Local announced that they are looking in 11 markets for project innovation for nonprofits who are making a difference through innovation in their uh, local areas and the applications can be submitted online between February 18th and March 25th for those of you who would be interested in knowing more about that. Let's go to the next slide, Jay. So here are the tips. Somehow they got a little, uh, uh, they're not in alignment, but that's okay. Um, see and do everything through the lens of your mission. Make sure your vision is aspirational except nothing less than a great board. I like uh, Arthur Francois said, he said, not on this board you don't. There are certain things board members must do and there are certain things that they cannot ignore. And so uh, not accepting anything less than a great board is very important. Create a good organizational working culture, build a culture of philanthropy, know your donors and measure and assess your progress. What gets measured gets done. And with that, we are have ended with the next slide, which reminds you about um, the fact that uh, this book, Think Like a Nonprofit, Act Like a Business, what every nonprofit organization should know and do will be released in September of 2023. And I can't wait for all of what's in me to come out on those pages. And so we end with, as we normally do, with a big thank you. Thank you so, so much, Gatsby. <laughs> I don't know you if you have your good. contact information here. Oh, you, you prompt people for questions. Perfect. Yes. So do you, have, do you have a couple minutes for maybe a couple of additional comments or questions? I sure do. OK, terrific. And well, if, if yeah. And the, mm -hmm. and the website is www.thegasbygroup.com. Thank you. Um, that's very important. And again, um, I hope everybody will take a look at the website, look for this book. And for all of you who have asked about a recording, 
uh, as well as the slide deck. Let's answer that now, but first I'm gonna stop screen sharing, which uh, was a matter of my trying to learn um, uh, telepathy while we were doing the presentation today. So if you saw any interruptions in the slides, that was me, that was not Gasby. Uh, let me go ahead and, and stop this, <laughs> stop that sharing. Um, Thank you so much, Jay. You've been a real trooper through our technical <laughs> difficulties here, honestly. <laughs> well, it was such wonderful content, I have to tell you, uh, and I'll, I'll make myself reappear, um, that, that uh, I didn't know all the things you were going to talk about. I hadn't seen the slide deck until today. There, we had 99 different comments and questions today, which I think is a record. So I want to thank wow. everybody for doing that. If you have additional questions, of course, we can probably take a couple minutes to field them. But Gatsby, may I also share all this content with you later? So if you'd like to interact with anybody, make comments about their mission statements, vision statements, their comments and questions, would you sure. be interested in having those? Okay, terrific. Yes, um, so please, please do. do feel free. Uh, and I'll, I'll make sure I refer all those on. Um, let me see, we have, uh, what was the information for the innovation grant that will be in the slide deck so gasby may i uh, also share the slides with people who attended today would that be all right well they will be on youtube you. some of the slides <laughs> are proprietary so unfortunately um I, I would need to get additional clearance and then some of them are just proprietary especially since the book has not been published yet so if you will just be patient with me on that uh you can see it on youtube but the slides are not available understandable um and i hope that means that people will go and make that extra effort of getting the book but also seeing the slides uh, rather the video which will be on youtube uh people may be watching this right now on youtube in the future uh so that'll be up there on the donor search site um within youtube so it's uh, uh youtube the donor search youtube channel rather um, but there is also uh, a lot of these recordings make their way directly onto the donor search website with links to YouTube. So if you'd like to see content like this, I hope you'll go to donorsearch.net as well. You can see all that under the resources tab. Um, I guess we were asked how people can purchase or pre-order the book. Is that possible to do yet? It's not possible now, but it will be possible in another month. We will be able to take advance orders. So if you can remember, to, I want that book and uh, go, go to our website. We will have it set up for advanced orders. And thank you very much for that interest. We do have a question about um, uh, a, a person who asks how you get past the scarcity mentality. Do you have thoughts on that? Yes, that whole abundance versus scarcity. Um, that is uh, something that falls within the category of fear of, of asking for money too. Uh, mm -hmm. For those people, the board members in particular and staff who feel a lot of fear that they will uh, be rejected, on the abundance side, the that part of the brain will say, well, I'm learning something. Even if I'm rejected, it doesn't mean like that it's forever. On the scarcity side, it's saying, I don't want to be rejected. It's personal. I cannot uh, be able to, to look at um, a person and them tell me no. So we use that as a platform for the abundance versus scarcity mentality. But then to counteract all of that from a data point of view, we point to the $471 billion that was given to charitable causes in 2020 and we expect that it will at least incrementally increase for 2021 despite COVID-19, despite other things. And so utilizing data to say, here is the abundance model. We do have a, a, a generous, uh, a, a great deal of generosity when it comes to giving. And the fact of the matter is we need to look at it as this is our turn to be able to be a part of um, asking, requesting, and getting gifts that make a difference for our organization as well. There's so much more we could dig into today, and I'm seeing that in the questions, but I think we have to end it here, unfortunately. But hopefully that means that people's appetite is properly prepared so that in one month, you can sign up as a pre-order for this book. 
Her purpose today was not to sell the book. We don't usually promote books, but obviously the content here is so valuable that I want to encourage people to get on that list. Um, I, and just as a personal note, Gatsby, uh, I, I also didn't know you were going to talk about all these vast pockets of philanthropy, which are so often ignored. And um, that was uh, really, really wonderful to hear Osceola McCarty's name and to know that you had had the opportunity to talk with her about her gift. Um, that's uh, that's a story we could spend a whole a whole session on right there. Um, so oh my I'm goodness. grateful. That was one of her. Jay. That was I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on your line, but that was one of the mountaintop moments of my life to be able to spend time with that humble and generous woman. I'm so sorry we don't have time for more questions because I'm really open to answering questions uh, to to the best of my ability. But uh, Jay. We'll just have to do this at some point in the future again. I would love that. And next time we'll make sure that the slides were all cooperating with the both of us. But uh, but I do appreciate your willingness to mush ahead nonetheless today. Um, we'd love to have you back. And everybody, uh, please do again, look for this video on YouTube, as well as uh, go over to Gatsby's site, learn all about her work, not just the book, but everything else she does. And can you tell us one more time how people can find your website? Yes, www.thegasbygroup.com. And Gasby is spelled G A S B Y, thegasbygroup.com. And we'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you so much for this. And thank you, everybody, for being here. If you're interested in more presentations like this, uh, although this one is clearly unique, uh, you'll find that there is a lot of great content in the Philanthropy and Masterminds program, which is brought to you, of course, by our friends at DonorSearch. They provide this platform. They've done it for several years. It's all this great non-commercial content like this with leaders like Gasby. I hope you'll return for some of those sessions. We have another one coming up next week uh, with Gail Perry, who is a name that probably many of you know. Uh, but there's uh, content that's coming every single week throughout this year. In fact, 90 different programs uh, between our podcasts, the webinars, and the webcasts. Please join us for the next one. Until then, please stay healthy out there. Take care of yourselves, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon.